Well, we begin today's show with the legendary Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hersh. In 1970, he won the prize for his reporting for the Dispatch News Service on the My Lai Massacre, when the U.S. slaughtered more than 500 Vietnamese women, children and old men on March 16, 1968. His reporting in The New York Times on CIA spying on anti-war activists during the Vietnam War era helped lead to the formation of the Church Committee which led to major reforms of the intelligence community. In 2004, in the pages of The New Yorker magazine, Cy Hirsch exposed the Abu Ghraib prisoner abuse scandal in Iraq. Well, last week, he published another bombshell report, but this time on his new Substack page. The piece was headlined, How America Took Out the Nord Stream Pipeline. It looks at one of the great mysteries of the past year. Who was behind the bombing of the Nord Stream pipelines, which were built to carry natural gas from Russia to Europe? The pipelines were severely damaged last September in a series of underwater explosions in the Baltic Sea. In his new piece, Cy Hirsch cites an unnamed source who says the sabotage was carried out by the U.S. Navy, which planted remotely triggered explosives during NATO exercises last September. Hirsch reports the Biden administration began planning the act of sabotage in December 2021, two months before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On February 7th, 2022, President Biden held a joint news conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and Biden brought up the future of the Nord Stream pipeline. Invades. Uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again. Then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. What do you, what, how will you, how will you do that exactly since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you we'll be able to do it. I'll promise you we'll be able to do that. Well, Cy Hirsch reports U.S. Navy divers planted remotely triggered explosives on the pipelines in June while NATO was conducting military exercises in the area. He reports the divers were all members of the Navy and not members of America's Special Operations Command, whose covert operations must be reported to Congress. Then, on September 25, 2022, a Norwegian surveillance plane dropped a sonar buoy, which triggered the C-4 explosives that had been placed on the pipeline. Soon after the explosion, the United States strongly suggested Russia was behind blowing up its own pipeline. This is National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan responding to a question at a White House press briefing. In his speech this morning, the president called the Nord Stream pipeline attacks, uh, quote, a deliberate act of sabotage. And he said, now the Russians are pumping out misinformation and lies about it. Should we take that to mean that the U.S. now believes that Russia was likely responsible for this act of sabotage? Well, first, Russia has done what it frequently does when it is responsible for something, which is make accusations that it was really someone else who did it. We've seen this repeatedly over time. But the president was also clear today that there is more work to do on the investigation before the United States government is prepared to make an attribution in this case. In the following months, there have been few public disclosures about the pipeline explosion. In December, The New York Times reported Russia had begun expensive repairs on the pipelines, a move which has raised questions about Western claims that Russia had bombed its own pipelines. Meanwhile, some Biden officials have publicly praised the fact that the pipeline was blown up. This is Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs Victoria Nuland speaking during a recent Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing. I am, and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. We're joined now by Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hirsch to talk more about his new piece, How America Took Out the Nord Stream Pipeline. While the White House has described Hirsch's reporting as, quote, complete fiction, calls are growing for an independent probe into the explosion. 
Cy Hirsch, welcome back to Democracy Now! If you can flesh out um, what it is you found in your report um, and what first tipped you off, um, albeit there were a lot of public comments, including the Polish government right after the bombing, saying, thank you, America. Lay it out for us, Cy. Well, first of all, I think the reporting really can be described as a friend of mine did. What I did was really deconstruct the obvious. I mean, you have to hear what the president said. But of course, there were there were secret plans that I'm writing about, um, and they include um, um, uh, there was a committee set up. Jake Sullivan was directly involved. He was the national security advisor, still is. Um, they set up a team to look at options about how to put pressure uh, on the um, uh, uh, on the Russian government to back off. I, I, I'm getting a bounce in my ear, so this is comical. Can you hear me? We hear you perfectly. We don't hear the bounce, Cy. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, I hear it though. Anyway, um, and so um, uh, there was a. I'm just writing about inside baseball stuff. It's the normal things you do. They set up a committee to think of options. Uh, Russia was clearly going to go. Uh, the threat the president had yet to make um, uh, had not been made. And this is December before before um, uh, New Year's Day of the, of the year before 2021. Um, and. The question inside the committee, and it included uh, the usual CIA, NSA, uh, Treasury Department, State Department, you name it, and uh, they met in the secret, secret office building in the uh, across the street from the White House, the executive office, office building. Uh, the option was, do you want us to do something um, uh, uh, kinetic or somebody not something not kinetic? In other words, uh, not kinetic would be uh, more sanctions, or something kinetic would be, you know, taking out the pipeline as had been thought about, and our answer came pretty quickly. I would guess uh, Victoria Newland's statement that you mentioned came actually before the president's. It came in late um, January of 2000, of last year. And that statement came, I, at that time, I think the, the committee involved, a lot of sophisticated people in, in the intelligence and operation community uh, concluded you could do it, and the White House was told it was possible. I think that led to the comments, which really, of course, made the people on the inside uh, go half crazy because it was supposed to be completely covert. But at that place, as I wrote, it was simply described as a classified operation. None of the rules of reporting to Congress involved are involved, were involved. And so they began their planning. They went to Norway, which is a great ally of ours. Norway was one of the original signers of the uh, 1949 NATO uh, uh, treaty. Um, I think 19 nations were involved then. And Norway is uh, a great ally. Uh, we have spent I write about this in some detail in, in the article, hundreds of millions, probably more than closer or to, to a billion or more um, upgrading facilities. Norway has a 1,400 mile border along the Atlantic coast uh, that goes from uh, Oslo in, in Europe all the way up north uh, into, it runs into the uh, Russian uh, border in, uh, in uh, above the Arctic Circle. So we do, we put a lot of facilities up north there. Um, uh, synthetic aperture radar, which costs a fortune to monitor the uh, Russian nuclear sites around and also their new military activities around there up in the uh, other side of the peninsula, in the Kola Peninsula. So it's it's just, they're just our guys. And they're also great at doing underwater stuff. And so that's what happened. We did a plan with them. We had to clear it with Sweden and Denmark. I'll leave it to them to decide whether that they were accepted the expl explanation we were doing exercises in the Baltic Sea for the hell of it. Uh, but so far, I haven't seen much from either of them. Um, and, you know, it, it's a tiresome game to me. Uh, and so what happens is when I do my story on Substack, uh, I wouldn't even think, um, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say it after all those wonderful years I had at the New York Times, I wouldn't even think of taking a story like this to the New York Times. Um, they've decided that the Ukraine war is going to be won by Ukraine, and, and that's what its readers get. And that's, so be it. Um, uh, that's their call. Uh, so um, I just did my reporting, and, and um, uh, uh, the, the miners came from a very facility in a, in a, in a, in a, a little small town in Florida. Um, and the mining community in the Navy is, is very secret, and, and they just do their business. They don't talk. That was perfect people to get, and they practiced it. And under, as you said, there was a major exercise every summer by the uh, Sixth Fleet, which uh, American Sixth Fleet out of out of uh, Italy, which controls also has the operational rights in the Baltic Sea. 
Baltic Sea is a huge, huge place. The pipelines we're talking about, Nord Stream 1, which came alive in 2011, and Nord Stream 2 was actually done, but the Germans that are ready to pump, pump, has uh, 750 miles. And uh, they go straight from from um, uh, from Russia, which is loaded with all kinds of gas. They're, they're in Siberia, they have enormous reserves, directly into Germany. And I can tell you, Nord Stream 1, was a godsend for the German economy and Western Europe. They, they put, produced so much gas at such low prices that the German government was actually able to resell some of the gas the Russians were providing uh, at a profit without Russia objecting. And so the German economy is huge, it's booming. You know, the, the cars we know about, they, Germany has the largest chemical company in the world, BASF. And everybody's, right now, it's, it's hell to pay. It's gotten very cold there. There's a lot of anger. And anyway, the purpose. By Hirsch, the- uh, so, so I wanted to ask you in terms of uh, the the lack of a. Uh, it always seemed to me when the, the claims were that uh, potentially Russia had uh, sabotaged its own pipeline that it was ludicrous to think that uh, that would be so that they would invest so much money in pipelines and then and then uh, uh, bomb them themselves. Uh, but uh, I'm interested in the lack of press attention uh, since uh, the sabotage occurred and also the lack of congressional attention. I think back to uh, the CIA's mining of the Managua harbors back in the early 1980s under the Reagan administration when the conservative Republican head of the Senate Intelligence Committee Barry Goldwater objected and raised concerns that this was a covert operation where Congress was not notified. And then, of course, Congress cut off uh, uh, aid to the Contras. As as a result, there was an international court of justice ruling against the United States. But in this case, this kind of sabotage, the media seems not to be at all interested in finding out what happened here, as you have, or uh, and Congress, there's no one in Congress uh, that's been raising questions. Uh, you listen to the newscast that you, we just <laughs> that we just heard uh, as the show opened. One horrible event after another. I think the world's taken a very bizarre turn. I also, th- you know, it doesn't matter what I think. There's no question. There's been a polarization of the press uh, since Trump got in. We're now we're now on two sides. You know, right, left, uh, Democrat, Republican, however you describe it. If you watch Fox News, you don't watch MSNBC, et cetera, et cetera. And if you read the New York Times. Uh, you 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 you're not going to get uh, what the right winger you know the, the conservatives have been after the New York Times and Washington Post for their quote quote unquote liberal views. So we've got a polarization going, and at this time we, we've got a president, a Democratic president, that has done some good stuff domest- domestically. But I I can tell you I'm I'm not understanding the com- total commitment to Ukraine, and I'm not understanding what I'm reading because obviously I have access to a lot of people who see things. I've been doing this, uh, Amy, and um, I've been doing this, what, writing about COVID activities for, am I, am I that old? 300 years. Anyway, the bottom line is um, the stories I've been getting about the war, particularly beginning in fall, and that's what gets interesting, have been pretty dire. Uh, the Russians, um, I don't think, I think the end is just a question of time. Right now, it's a question of how many more people Zelensky wants to kill of his own people. It's going to be over. What happened? Is the plan was to put the bomb, the, uh, the, and I can't answer your philosophical question about why Congress isn't doing anything anymore. Congress is pretty much polarized just as much. And, um, and there's also um, an enormous uh, continuing of uh, hatred of uh, all things Putin in this country, um, which is uh, foreign policy disagreements are one thing, but it's very personal here. And that's not useful. But anyway, the other, the other, you know, he is. I don't think there's any chance that Putin wants to take over Europe. I don't think he wants to take. He wants to have Ukraine tamed, but he's not interested in doing anything more. But I, that's I may be in a minority about that. Anyway, what happens is it was there was an exercise in June, and it was supposed to um, the the bombs were put in there under the cover of a of a, a, a NATO exercise. There were a lot of different countries running around. Um, with divers um, and uh, bowling up things. It was an exercise to go find and chase mines. There never had one, been one before. It actually was whoever in the CIA or in the other agencies that thought this up should get a bow because it was pretty ingenious. So in that exercise, the divers went down, did what they were trained to do. They're very good. C4, a couple hundred, whatever the weight is, um, bombs enough to blow up most cities, most buildings in, 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 uh, in Washington. 
and may some in New York anyway. Um, they did their job, but the president at the last minute uh, hesitated because he was afraid um, blowing it up right after the exercise would put the finger at us. And then he wanted permission to do it any time, and that caused an enormous trouble in the team. The team was, you know, people are sophisticated in the intelligence services. I know we, we have cliches about them. We see the movies about them. Uh, and the bottom line is um, they were, this made sense of them uh, blowing up a pipeline, <laughs> blowing up a pipeline. Owned by, it's actually owned by uh, a division of say, Gazprom runs 51%. That's all the Russian oligarchs. And 49% of the Nord Stream 1 are, are owned by four business uh, groups in the Western Europe who, who farm out the oil anyway. Uh, they saw the threat as being valid. Um, and if you wanted to do it during an exercise, well, okay. But in September, late September, they got the word, you know, they, they fixed it so he could. But then they thought it was, I don't know what they thought, but I don't think they thought in late September he would blow up the main pipeline, Nord Stream 2, which is a new one uh, um, that had been uh, con just built and it had been sanctioned. It had gas in it. That's why so much leaks. 750 miles of methane gas were sitting in it, but it had been, it had been sanctioned by the German government. And so when he did that, Here's what Biden did, and this is what I think the ultimate point of the story, and why so many people, even the intelligence community, are very troubled by it. What he did is he said, I'm in a big war with Ukraine. It's not looking good. Uh, I want to be sure I get German and West, West European support, and I know winter's coming, and if it's going to be bad, I don't want the Germans to say, we got to check out because we're, gonna, we're get, getting massacred. We'll be massacred with no, no, no cheap fuel. And um, our, our economy will go bonkers. We're going to check out and we're going to open up the gas line, which they could do. So he took away that option. And what that has done, as you know, America has been talking about ever since the first pipeline, Nord Stream 1, came online in 2011. And it was there were years before it was being built. This goes back to the Ch Ch Bush Cheney um, uh, years. And, and as you know, um, uh, I did a lot of reporting for The New Yorker on, on those people. Uh, that particular gaggle. <laughs> anyway, and um, uh, at that time, they began to talk about the threat, the, the, the threat of, of, of gas, the threat of oil, cheap energy for Europe would always seen as a threat to make Europe be more palatable or more willing to trade with Russia. We always wanted to isolate Russia. This has been a theme of the last decades. Uh, well, well Simon, but, but can I ask you also the... Uh, there are several people, obviously you've gotten criticism at times for many of your exposés, but there are some people who are saying that this particular expose does not have a whole lot of documentation that it essentially relies on one source uh, uh, of uh, uh, one internal source, anonymous source of yours. Uh, how do you respond to those, uh, those criticisms that this is uh, much less uh, documented than previous exposés of yours? I'll get to that, but let me finish my thought because it's a very important thought. The fear was uh, Europe would pass away, walk away from the war. And now what he's done, and you have to lift it up a little bit. There you go. There. Now what he's done is he's told Europe, uh, you're second, you're second rate. And I think the consequences of this for the Europeans are going to be horrific. They really, this has cut into the notion that they can depend totally on America, even in a crisis. And I think it's going to undercut NATO, which I always found to be supremely useless. But certainly the European countries are going to be, uh, I know people that are paying five times as much now for electricity. Uh, people are paying three or four times more for gas. There's not enough of it. It's very expensive. It's colder now than it was in the fall. They had a light fall because of uh, climate change, if you want to believe it or not. And anyway, I think the consequences politically for us are enormous. I think the reason that Biden and the, his uh, people in the White House have denied the story and continue to deny it and get accepted by uh, some of the press, my old newspaper, The New York Times. I, I don't know why they're not doing more reporting on this instead of relying on a denial and walking away from the story. Ditto for The Washington Post. Uh, I think the consequences politically for us in the long run, looking at even potential some countries walking out of NATO, if that's what he thinks, that our being cold is less important than him keeping a war going that he's not going to win, um, uh, is it, it strikes me. As for the source question, I, you know, I've been doing this so long. Uh, I'm not bothered by the fact that 
that uh, the government attacks me and that my old newspaper, the New York Times, hasn't written a word about it. I find it sort of, you know, that's where we are. That's why people like me are in Substack. It's a self-publishing thing. I don't have to worry about censorship or second thoughts. Uh, but I don't talk about sources. I just, I just, you know, I'm lucky. I've had for 20 or 30 or 40 years people inside who not only are faithful to what they're doing, but also are not afraid to be critical of it. And so um, uh, that's the kind of source that, uh, you know, reporters, you know, uh, dream about. And I've had people like that uh, for forever, and I still do. And so um, um, there's been a lot of criticism. One of the things is, one of the things I will get to your point about criticism, one of the criticisms of the open source people, you know, OSINT, it's a very big part of the world now. There are people that monitor air traffic and boat traffic and all that, and there's some two or three different groups have um, have uh, produced a uh, statement saying that none of the things they they see tracks with my story. And I would say about that, if if you're in the in the intelligence community, you've been running COVID ops for years, and you're in Norway, we're working very closely with the Norwegians on this, who, by the way, have increased their production of oil to Europe uh, by double the proper. It was, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's gone up at least double, maybe even more than that, two and a half times as much now without the, without the, without the pipeline. But certainly, the first thing you look at is how to take care of open source people, make them think what happened isn't happening. I mean, that's that's so obvious to me, but not to them. Um, and so, Sai, um, si, I wanted go to go to what Ned Price said at the State Department. Sam Husseini of the Institute for Public Accuracy questioned the State Department spokesperson about your reporting last week. I'm sure you're aware of the new report from Seymour Hersh, how America took out the Nord Stream pipeline and the White House's denial of any involvement. Given the longstanding U.S. Mm -hmm. opposition to the pipeline, Secretary Blinken's calling its demise a tremendous opportunity. And Secretary, Under Secretary of State Newland's saying that the U.S. officials were pleased with the destruction of the pipeline, and especially the Sweden's secretive investigation. Do you think the U.S. government's uh, denial of involvement is credible? I absolutely do, and I repeat it here. Um, Anything so else? Let me follow up on that, if I might. Um, have you or anybody else at the State Department um, been in communication with German, Norwegian ambassadors or other allies or officials on this matter? On the matter of Nord Stream 2? On the matter of the latest allegations, um, which give a fairly, I mean, it's it is, anonymous it is, source. It but, is, but it is a fairly detailed. It is, uh, it, would, it would not be. Uh, it, it would it would not be typical for us to engage allies and partners on something that is utter and complete nonsense and that should be rejected out of hand uh, by anyone who is looking at it through uh, <clears throat> through an objective lens. Yes, go one, ahead. One, one more aspect on this. One of the allegations that Hirsch makes is that it was taken off the CIA in order to prevent involvement uh, oversight uh, as a covert operation. Did you read the piece? I'm familiar with it. Uh, one of his allegations is that it was taken off the Look, r r rather than let this this propaganda get, get, be, be aired in in the briefing room but let, 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 let me just say it is a fundamental misunderstanding of oversight in our US Congress beyond getting his facts entirely wrong as he has before in very uh, high profile ways uh, it is a fundamental misunderstanding to suggest that our intelligence community is not subject to oversight anyone who writes that anything who writes anything like that no, no, uh, should, no, should not be not believed on any no, no, no. that he, he wrote puts forward. that it was taken off of uh, a CIA and put under military in order to prevent our military is also subject to rigorous oversight that, that, that's my uh, question that's yes. my question the answer is yes so that's Ned Price being questioned by Sam Husseini in the State Department press briefing room. Um, Cy Hirsch, I'm wondering if you can respond. You wrote an interesting follow-up today on Substack uh, called Crap on the Wall. Now, it's not your words, actually. Uh, you're actually quoting um, the White House uh, when they—the uh, most too bizarre effort came from Defense Department of Donald Rumsfeld, you write, two decades ago, Secretary 
Rumsfeld Vice President Richard Cheney discarded the rule of law and common decency in their efforts to stomp out Muslim terrorism. I was writing for The New Yorker. You're talking about the Abu Ghraib scandal. The White House responded to an article I published about the CIA's secret operations — oh, no, no, inside Iran — by calling it another example of Hirsch throwing crap — that was the word used by an assistant secretary of defense on a wall to see what sticks. Uh, under Barack Obama, you say, a senior national security adviser responded, Seymour Hirsch is a known fabricator, adding the magazine, The New Yorker, could publish that response to any future Hirsch story without further checking. Your response to all of this? Well, uh, well my long-gone mother, who came here as an immigrant and loved America more than anybody, particularly about Ned Price's stuff, she, said she, would, she would have said he should have washed out his mouth with soap which is what she actually did to me a few times. So anyway, that's what, what can I say? It's, you know, uh, sometimes, um, uh, I won't say truth, that's too, uh, sometimes different versions of a story um, uh, cause problems. This, the, the reason I went into that sort of soliloquy about what's gonna happen possibly in NATO and Europe about Biden's act of saying to the Western Europe and Germany, we, ra we, ra we rather keep our war going I think, and you can stay cold, is I think it could cause some countries to say, we may be out of here, you know, what, what do we need NATO for? And American support, when in a crisis, they take away our, our ability to keep our people warm. It also could lead, I think the Green Party has done very well in Germany, it's it, the chancellors are from the Green Party. I think it's going to lead to widespread conservative movement politically. And the one thing we did after World War II was, that was fantastic was we re rebuilt Europe into a, a modern democratic plurality, a society, plural society. I think it could lead to um, not, it won't go as far as it did in Italy, we could lead to some conservative victories and uh, subsequent le legislations. Because Europe's always had no natural resources, they've always had to rely on others. And um, the others included us and also Russian gas. And if we want to stop that off, we do it at a political cost. And I think the point I'm making is I'm still going to do more reporting on this um, because I, there's still things I, I, I need to write about later. Um, I think that this has probably been, in the view of some of the people who did it, one of the dumbest things American government has done in years. And we've had four years of Trump, you know. It's in the long run, I just don't understand why more newspapers, good newspapers like the Times, just still, you know, I still, I still read the New York Times. I, I don't believe everything they say about Ukraine, but it's still, they've got wonderful reporters there. My attitude towards editors is, if we got rid of 90% of the editors in the world, we'd be much better off. But that's always been, since I was a kid reporter, I thought that. So, you know, um, I don't care what they say. I mean, if I did, I would, I would weep because some of the stuff is so dumb. It's just so dumb. And and um, the Biden administration. Um, um, uh, putting uh, Ned Price, uh, he's paid to work. I don't fault him. He, he he actually knows intelligence. He had a career in intelligence. And he, from all I know, he's a perfectly decent. I know people that know him personally, and he's a fine guy. He's just being told what to say. And he said and, it. And so, sorry. You, you gotta, uh, sorry. Let me, say, yeah. let me just say this. You got to go back to the state, state Tony Blinken. After the bombing in, in September, he made a speech in which he, it was a press conference, in which he made a gratuitous statement. He said, one good thing is that no more will, will Russia be able to weaponize gas. And the notion of Russia weaponizing gas with Western Europe to get fame and to diminish our power over or our authority or our, our economic ability, uh, control over Western Europe has been a theme of this country for, tw for two decades. It's not a new theme. Oil, oil scares the hell. Russian oil and gas always scared the hell out of oil, out of Washington. Uh, now your question and, and, is still. And, yeah, and so I, the, the, uh, lastly, the uh, the Norwegian government has uh, has claimed that one of the ships that you mentioned in your article that was uh, 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 involved in the planning of this or preparation of this was uh, 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 was not uh, present uh, at the time of these uh, exercises. W what do you make of Norway's uh, denial? You know, let me tell you something about Nicaragua you don't know. One of the things that happened in Nicaragua, the CIA guys operating there would thrill and get excited. Uh, there were speeches there. And, you know, even even in the worst of times of the Sardinista movement, 
they would go in their little motorboats off the beaches and shoot flechettes into the beaches and have a contest to see, you know, I, I, I shouldn't say the latter. They would just shoot and know there were casualties. They would just do that and have a lot of fun talking about it and bragging about it. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you get to do when you have a COVID operation. And so um, uh, uh, the Norwegian government is, that's just completely, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I dropped something here. The government, not only did that ship have a, uh, it was in the operation, it also had a uh, compression chamber that had been flown in by the CIA. Now I'm getting the details I don't want to bother with. The CIA flew in a compression chamber that's going to put on the ship because it, it's just a submarine hunter. And the, the divers had 260 feet. That's where they, that's the level. The Norwegians found the gross, lowest level, the, the, the shallowest part of the Baltic Sea, uh, which is off an island called, that's well, between Sweden and, and uh, Denmark. And uh, they practiced there. They had to. And, and for the divers, it was 260 feet deep where the, where the uh, landlines were. And the pipelines are steel covered, but they're also covered by concrete shields. So it's a serious job to blow them up. And at 260, without a compression chamber, they'd have to go up every 90 feet. They, they're, they're, they're breathing, uh, it's amazing to me, they're breathing oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. Um, it, that's pretty amazing to me. Uh, and they'd have to go up. Uh, to, now they could just pop up to the surface. So the it was called the Alta. The, the ship was there. I mean, uh, that's just such a stupid lie. But the 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 the, my, the, the, sub, the my, it's a my, it's a submarine hunter. They didn't have to stay there. They just, they could just go, and the guys could jump off. And there was no long recovery. At a certain time, they would come up, and the time was fixed. You don't you don't drop. Uh, uh, explosives like that, and then let them go off in five minutes. You give a lot of time. You have a timer on it so that the the, the pilot, the divers, could get up to the top. And they come up and they make a pickup. It can be happen much more quickly than you think because there is, it's not in the it's not in the description of the ship. But on that ship, there was a decompression chamber. It had been flown in and planted there, uh, in by the CIA. This was actually a brilliant operation, if you want to know it from the point of view of a of a classic operation, uh, because they got away with it. And at that point, um, um, uh, um, the purpose was always, as, let me go back to this, the purpose for doing it is to make the threat credible. But then you have the president and the undersecretary of state within a, a weeks or two of getting a word that it's credible, we can do it. Start blabbing about it. Of course, that was disillusioning <laughs> to the people involved, but so what? I can't talk about it. You know, you can, you can say it's not true. I invented it, but that's just, look, he did it. And he's going to have up to it. I watch my mail. I watch my Gmail. And I'm seeing every day more and more, more than, more than I want. I'm seeing more messages from around the world, different countries teaming in. Um, I'm seeing that. I'm seeing something that was, um, uh, and by the way, in Substack, it, it was, I, I didn't know about Substack. It's an amazing platform. They had more than a million hits on the thing within a day. Well, I mean, people, what were the messages I got from people who said, thank God, we miss the kind of reporting that you and others have done. We don't see it anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about your showing me. I guarantee you, not that. Well, Seymour Hersh, we want to thank you so much for being with us. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist will link to your new piece on your Substack: how America took out the Nord Stream pipeline. Come